Because I'm so glad to be here and be here at Acton. Uh, I was part of Acton University in June a couple years ago. If you've not had that opportunity, what an amazing, uh, mind-stretching, humbling, as you get around just some great minds and hearts and learn about things that you hadn't thought about before and aren't sure you can quite grasp yet and how they stretch you. And so I'm grateful for their work in this area. It is so great to see so many of you that I know as well uh, from KCC. It's going to change my stories, unfortunately, because <laughs> I've got truth police here. Uh, they would have been a lot better if those folks hadn't been here. Uh, and then others from Fellowship, uh, Order of the Towel, Chico used to convene us, and uh, Jonathan, David, and just some other community gatherings. It's just wonderful to be back here. And this is home for both Jan and my wife and uh, me. Well, we grew up in this area and then we're away to Indiana Wesleyan and then back here for 30 years and now back to Marion. So I've lived in two places, Grand Rapids, Marion, Grand Rapids, Marion in my life. And uh, someday, Lord willing, we'll end up back in this area because we'd love to have that opportunity. Well, one of the, <laughs> thank you. Uh, one of the great joys that I have in my work today is to walk alongside pastors and to see what is happening in their lives. This is not a doom and gloom presentation today. It's optimistic. It's optimistic about the possibility of longevity and vitality in ministry. But there are certain um, domains, I guess is the word that I use, that must continue to be developed if we're going to have that kind of longevity and vitality in ministry. And so I want to talk with you about them today, kind of lay the groundwork for that, take a half hour or so to do that, and I'd really love to open it up for questions and have us learn from each other a little bit before our time is done. Uh, right before uh, 11 this morning. Uh, I also um, will give you some questions along the way to get you thinking, and maybe they'll come into questions that you have uh, as well during our time together. As you can see from the screen, this is kind of a picture of the area we're going to explore, pastoral persistence, and I'm struck by the parallel between some of the research that's out there about pastors who persist or pastors who experience longevity and vitality and how that corresponds to some work I've been doing in Romans chapter 12, especially since I discovered that Romans 12 doesn't end with verses 1 and 2, but it goes on. And there are other good things in that chapter. And uh, those that confluence of the word in Romans 12 and some of the research has been a real a blessing to me, and I hope it's a blessing to you today. You know, as I look at my own life and speak just autobiographically for a moment, I'm probably, Lord willing, about 80% through my full-time ministry. I, I hope to always serve in some way. I just passed my 36th uh, anniversary or birthday in ministry this past June. I love the fact that 30 of those years, God gave me the privilege of serving Kentwood Community Church and of growing up in that church as they graciously extended their love and forgiveness as this rookie made so many mistakes over the years. And then uh, for the past nearly six years have served in the context of, of Wesley Seminary. And in that context, uh, we serve adult students. So our youngest student is 21. Our oldest student is 80. Our average age student is 44. So what that does is it regularly gives me a glimpse into the lives of people who are somewhere on their ministry journey, many of them at the halfway point. And so it's been very enriching for me to see a variety of women and men, a variety of formats for ministry, bivocational being very prominent among us, a variety of context in ministry, urban, suburban, rural, a variety of ethnicities, a variety of denominations, to see what that journey is like as they engage with us in a learning process, which for many is a fine-tuning and deepening process uh, along in their journey. 
So we see students in all seasons of ministry and all structures of ministry. More than ever before, people are entering ministry in the halftime season of their life. Marketplace to ministry, success to significance, encore, whatever language you want to use for it, many people are interest entering ministry at that point. So from the perspective of someone who served a while in a local church and someone who's serving in a context where a variety of people are serving the church, and then one more advantage, there's a couple of Indiana institutions that have been particularly helpful. One is the Lilly Endowment, which is very engaged in pastoral well-being and uh, particularly the impact of economics and finances on pastoral well-being. We're engaged cooperatively in a research project with them. And then also Notre Dame, which is very interested in pastoral well-being and is doing an extensive survey in our particular slice of, th of the church, the Wesleyan Church was cooperating with Notre Dame in that survey to stutter, to study, not stutter, to study, uh, maybe I stutter along the way, but to study uh, some of the ways in which pastors flourish. That's been the term that's been more used in that context, the idea of flourishing. One of our uh, seminary faculty who has an extensive pastoral background, ministering in an urban context and with many people who've really experienced traumatic brokenness, uh, pictured what happens to pastors in this way. He said often what begins to develop is the Pharisee syndrome, where pastors uh, retreat to knowledge they begin to use that knowledge to critique, critique, diminish people. They begin to be oriented towards certain rules and behaviors rather than grace and relationships. And that is combined with a vision leak. Vision does leak. And uh, so they begin to lose that sense of vision maybe they had entered ministry with. He says first they dry up. So there's an internal dimension to it as they become arid in their soul and then they act out and that's the point at which many people begin to recognize uh, some of the uh, difficulties that are experienced uh, in ministry and then they burn out that acting out and combined with that dryness may lead them to burn out and they fall out they exit ministry sometimes they actually exit ministry physically and sometimes they just exit ministry emotionally and personally. So what is it that contributes to flourishing or vitality, longevity, and prevents on the flip side of the coin this kind of process from unfolding in a pastor's life? Well, I've... Um, as I've looked at this and I've walked alongside my others in the process as well as experienced it myself, I think there are three domains, if you will, that are, are critical in this regard. One is what I call the personal, uh, excuse me, the internal domain, what's going on inside of me. It might be called the spiritual domain. How is my own spiritual life doing? How am I... Um, in terms of my capacity to experience intimacy with God and to hear his voice. And when there's a loss of that intimacy or that loss of that capacity to feel like you're hearing from God, certainly the risk factor becomes evident. The second is the personal domain, and that's how I relate um, and understand myself. So many train wrecks in ministry happen as a result of a lack of self-awareness or a lack of self-regulation, even if you are aware. And so that whole area of personal uh, management. And then the third domain is that of the relational domain. So I was working in these areas and discussing these with colleagues and it struck me at the same time as I was studying Romans 12 that I believe they're present here. Now, this is not a, and it'll become evident very quickly, this is not a detailed exegesis of Romans 12, but what it is, is an opportunity to say it begins with the personal or transformation domain, if you will, and then it moves to, in the verses that follow, how connected am I to the body, to others, 
and yet how differentiated am I from others so that I have my own sense of being an individual, a person, but not being isolated? And then how deep and wide do my relationships go? And that really, as I look at Romans 12, is what's being unfolded there, and it corresponds to those domains of the internal or spiritual being there at the top, the beginning of the chapter, and then uh, the personal domain, my understanding of myself, and then the, the extent to which that ripples out into all of life. So let me begin with that first domain, the internal or spiritual domain. These are very familiar verses, I'm sure, to everyone who's here. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Again, out of Romans 12, maybe out of the Bible, um, these are among the most familiar passages. Years ago, in a moment of weakness, I agreed to teach a, an intro uh, to homiletics course uh, to a group of people, and uh, there were 24 students in this context, and um, I'm, this is my second mistake. I, uh, I said, you can pick whatever passage you want to preach from, and um, I told them that, uh, that often when you're first learning to preach, shorter is better, so that at the 15 minute point, I would turn off the tape recorder. Th these were things they used to have uh, that uh, maybe some of you aren't familiar with them, but uh, back then it was literally a tape recorder. I said, whatever, whatever happens at 15 minutes, that's it. I'm hitting the button, it's done. That's your conclusion. So I'm only going to, I didn't say this, but put myself through 15 minutes of this <laughs> for each of you as students. Well, as I said, my mistake was I asked them to select a passage, and the passage half of them selected was Romans 12, 1 and 2. So I saw these ver verses tortured in a variety of ways, and uh, maybe it's then that it really just stuck deeply in me. I think this is a great picture of intimacy. The, the greater my consecration, the greater my presentation and availability to God, the less compartmentalization there is in my life where I hold out this room and that room and this corner and that corner, then the more that I can experience a different kind of life that's not patterned by the world and the greater my capacity to discern what God's will is. So this is the inner capacity to hear his voice and to do his will. When pastors begin to lose this capacity, when they no longer long for this capacity, the dryness begins to settle in. The superficiality, the tendency to hydroplane through life and ministry starts to happen. Years ago, um, we had a guy at Kentwood Community Church when I was serving there named Lloyd Reeb. Lloyd is a business person who wrote a book called From Success to Significance. And he came in to talk about his journey, uh, being very effective in the marketplace. But in, in his case, I do believe business in the marketplace is a calling. In his case, he felt he was to move towards a calling of vocational ministry. And so we had this wonderful time of interaction with Lloyd, and at the end, he said, you know, Wayne, the book is called From Success to Significance, but there's something beyond significance. He said, the problem is it doesn't start with an S, it doesn't fit good on a book cover, so, you know, it's a little harder, you know, success to significance, so catchy, I had to leave it there, but, uh, so I said, what is it? He said, success, yes, significance, but when you realize that the creator of the universe whispers in your ear, 
He says there's nothing quite like it. And this is one of the most uh, effective dimensions of greatest effectiveness of ministry, fruitfulness, but it's also one of the most restorative to know that I'm connected to the vine, I'm hearing his voice, my sheep know my voice. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, speaking to the church. Um, wow, nothing quite like it. So this leads me to the first couple of questions. How may unpresented areas offer your bodies as a living sacrifice? How may unpresented areas impact our relationship with God and others? Some time ago, as an exercise of my own spiritual discipline, I went through my life and I, I mapped what I called my offering plate moments. Significant moments where I presented myself to God and the transformation that took place as part of it. What was it that prompted that presentation? And often it was pain of my own stupidity. And what was it that benefited me from, that I learned from, uh, that presentation? And I've come to believe that it's often those unpresented areas, those reserved areas, compartments unsurrendered, that end up taking out pastors. To the greater extent of our presentation to him. And then the second is how may patterns of conformity impact our relationship with God and others? You know, one of my favorite sayings in premarital counseling is the scary thing is not who you find out your partner is. It's who you find out you are when you're married. Because stuff comes out of you that you didn't know it was there before you were married, when you get into that kind of a deep and intimate relationship. And there were some patterns, as there is almost in everybody's life, learned in a household of origin that can be destructive. And to what extent do you allow the household of origin or the patterns of the world to shape that intimacy with your spouse uh, compared to the transformation that takes place. And when consecrated, God doesn't tend to reveal his will to people who aren't consecrated to him because he doesn't know where they're going to go with it, well, how they're going to distort it, pervert it, prostitute it. And what it, those areas of conformity, when I s make those surrenders and experience those transformations, then as a result of that, this intimacy, this sense of hearing God's voice, the sense of I'm doing life with God, uh, so critical and helpful for us in ministry. Second area, one of my favorite verses because one of the critical skills we discover in our work as a seminary, particularly since we deal with adult students later in life, uh, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has distributed to each of you. Four times in that verse, for now, oh, the word Greek word for think is used, and it's talking about a self-awareness. The ability to think of yourself accurately, not overestimating, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but not underestimating. Remember, there's a measure of faith involved in this estimation. By the way, it's the same over and under problem that's in 1 Corinthians 12 where it talks about some people thinking they're the whole deal, the whole body, and they don't need others, and other people thinking, I don't belong, I, I don't have a place same kind of issue that Paul deals with in Corinthians as he does here in Romans 12. So there's this need to think about yourself, but what I've discovered is some people are oblivious to how they function, who they are. They're not self-aware, but some people are consumed 
they're, you know, too self-focused. They're so I don't think it's any mistake that he says, think about yourself, but also, you know, get beyond yourself. <laughs> don't get stuck there. For just as each of us has one body with many members, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So there's a unity that I experience with others. But there's also a diversity. All the members do not have the same function. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So, first source of longevity and vitality is this intimacy with God that prompts me to surrender to him, gladly give myself to him, and as a result, the level of discernment of his will goes up. The first thing that follows that is this discernment of myself, who I am, how he's wired me, who I am as a person, and how that connects with others uh, who are in the body of Christ. The reminder that I'm not the whole body. I don't have all the gifts. Well, keep that context in mind, and I want to take you to a writer who is not a professor a professing Christian, not a pastor, but I think has caused the light bulb for me to come on in this area because all the, the dimensions of what are, are located in this passage, I believe, are reflected in these words. His name is Edwin Friedman, and his book is The Failure of Nerve. And, and it's really quite a fascinating book about leadership and you know it reminds me of the times in scripture that repeated be strong and courageous be strong and courageous so often the issue is a lack of courage at a key moment well this is kind of the concept of the failure of nerve and he talks about being well differentiated and that means being connected to people but also knowing who you are individually, having that ability to have a sense of self. And here are the five capacities he mentions. One is, oh, pastors, we need, we need God's grace for this, the capacity to separate oneself from surrounding emotional processes. Early lesson for me, caring everything home um, not understanding this one just about destroyed me in my er in my late 20s early in my ministry that there's a difference between pleasing people and loving people you can love people even when they're not happy about how you're loving them but pleasing them, wow, ultimately that doesn't do them any good and it's certainly destructive. How can that person experience what they're experiencing and yet I can separate myself appropriately from it? The capacity to obtain clarity about one's own principles and vision. What is it that God has led me to do? The contribution I believe that I'm to make. What are the theological convictions that I hold? Mike already mentioned here at the Acton, variety of theological perspectives, etc. Really wrestling with scripture and how those are to be owned personally. The willingness to be exposed and to be vulnerable, transparent, appropriately so. Obviously, different uh, settings and context and levels of transparency. The persistence, <laughs> I love this, in the face of inertial resistance. One of the early lessons I had to learn in ministry is any change process, even if it's a good idea, even if it's God's idea, involves resistance. Four sa stages, denial, resistance, which is the reason people live in denial. Denial, resistance, exploration, change. 
Change theory says if there's been no resistance, there's been no change. We are all about leading people to change. We are all about transformation. We are all about helping them to take new steps and gatherings of people to take new steps. And then finally, self-regulation of emotions in the face of reactive sabotage. Oh, loaded words once again. When someone's out to get me, how can I still manage, regulate the emotions within me? Uh, my own personal walk and experience is there's a tendency either to be too engaged and have to please people and to fully enter in or to react to that by becoming disengaged. It's a ditch on either side. The challenge is for you to know me, for me to share my heart, and yet in that transparency and the bonds that are formed, not take responsibility for you and the things you and God must work on with my encouragement and my prayerful support. Uh, I could spend the rest of the time talking about the errors and the learnings and the challenges in this area. Uh, but I, I do think I've learned the difference between loving and pleasing people I do think I'm learning, and Jerry DeRyder down here certainly helped me through one of the most difficult times in this area, to have crucial conversations and to believe that can be healthy, that conflict can actually strengthen instead of weaken. And I think I'm learning that um, my identity, my security, are not in my popularity. Um, you know, I was privileged to serve uh, KCC for 30 years. When I was just a kid in college, I prayed a prayer. God, would you call me to a community where I could spend a lifetime? There were two unique things about that prayer for this kid. One was the idea of being called to a community rather than a church. And the other was the idea of a lifetime versus a particular time and then to move on. Prayed that prayer. God called me to Kentwood, Michigan. There was no Wesleyan church in that area at that time, new suburb in Grand Rapids. And... Uh, and I said, I'm there for a lifetime. Here's where I made my mistake. None of you have ever made this, so I'm going to tell you so you never make it, okay? God gives you something, and you get excited about it, and then you add to it. So he said a lifetime. I thought, you know, well, it would be helpful to know how long a lifetime is. And the Bible, you know, well, the number 40 comes up a lot. And it moved from being God has called me to this community for a lifetime to God has called me to this community for 40 years. That was my addition. By the way, God doesn't really appreciate our additions to his revelation. <laughs> he doesn't feel any obligation to... Make sure our additions are fulfilled. So 30 years in, when God said, you're released, it's done. No one was more surprised than me. So I pulled out my calendar, tried to bring God up to speed about the time frames of things, you know, 30 years, uh, 40 years is the goal, God. You know, we're 10 years short. Yeah, we got a decade here. And I was loving um, the multiplication of other churches that was happening. I was loving the multi-ethnic ministry that was developing, very energizing. And he said, you're done. Well, I didn't know what was next. I called it my Abrahamic adventure, you know, 
Genesis 12, Hebrews 11, between the go and the will show, there's a don't know. And that don't know was deeply purifying for me because I discovered, even though I'd have said my identity and my security were in Christ, after you're somewhere 30 years and you grew up there in ministry as an adult and the community is such a part of your life and it's over, wow, who are you and where does your resource, your source come from? And it really tested me in that time and these questions, how am I developing my sense of self-reflection, thinking about myself and self-regulation. And what is my capacity for connection to really belong with others and then function with them, be members of the body? That's that differentiation. There is a sense of self, but I am part of the body. The third domain, deep relationships, the relational domain, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, so there's sincerity, there's purity, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another, honor one another, the priority of relationships. And then uh, how wide are those relationships? Do they extend beyond familiarity and do they extend beyond similarity share with the Lord's people who are in need practice hospitality my favorite definition of hospitality is practice the love of strangers pursue the love of strangers might be an alternate translation to this and we know that biblically hospitality is not a matter of being kind or etiquette it's a matter of obedience so how deep and how wide are my relationships with others um, and I got to say in my own life um, it was learning to go deep and go wide that then helped me to reflect and regulate on myself and opened up new areas that I needed to present to God. So in that original kind of diagram, you saw the arrows were feeding each other because when you relate to others well, it brings to light things that you have to address in your own walk with God. As far as going deep, uh, 31 years in January, I will celebrate with my accountability partner. Um, we were just two young guys. He's in business, living out his calling of Christ, myself in vocational ministry. Every other week for 31 years nearly, we've sat across from each other and we've said, okay, how have you done with the commitments that you said are important to you and you want to be consistent not perfect but consistent you want your batting average to go up in these areas and then 10 or 15 years into that relationship we added the question out of the book ordering your private world by Gordon McDonald uh, how is it with your private world and other than my wife Jan who knows me very well and feels complete freedom to speak into my life on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, no one knows me better and speaks into my life more deeply uh, than Paul Anthony. So learning about deep in marriage and in accountability and then learning about wide. And it was really uh, in this community that God stretched my hospitality in ways I will forever be grateful. When I came to Kentwood Community, uh, well, came to Kentwood, there was no church there at that time. Uh, 
Kentwood was about 98% Anglo. And I'm confident the vast majority of those were Dutch. And, uh, and that's the way our church was. Well, like often happens, the community changes, but the church doesn't. And even though others saw it before I did, some of the people who are sitting in this room did, um, part of the reason I didn't see it is we were located near the expressway and people would drive in. So we became a regional church as we increasingly became disconnected from our local community. And then God reminded me that he had called me to a community and that it was non-optional to hop over the community because I wasn't particularly prepared for the changes it was experiencing in order just to minister to the broader region or to minister to just a segment of the community. I'll never forget 2005, sitting in the Willow Creek Leadership Summit, Bill Hybels giving a talk on holy discontent that God used to corner me and wreck me. Because I had a favorite saying, our goal is to permeate this community with the good news of Jesus Christ. And I felt like he said, you know, that voice, that intimacy. Wayne, is that the whole community or is that only the 70% who look and think and act like you? Because if it's the 70%, at least have the integrity to stand before people and to say, by God's grace, we're going to permeate 70% of this community with the good news of Jesus Christ. And that began a journey for me, this monocultural kid who grew up in Rockford, Michigan, to learn. made so many rookie mistakes that hurt so many people, but I made a few good decisions. One is to connect with a band of brothers here in the city. Chico convened us and so many others that very diverse group in terms of ministry context, et cetera. Um, in this case, um, guys, but uh, certainly uh, a richness in terms of the ethnic diversity. And uh, brought some people into my life who were the safe people to ask dumb questions. And they were safe and I was dumb, so it was a good arrangement. And I thought it was about reaching. I thought it was about evangelism. What I only later realized is it was about that, but it was about discipleship. It was about the richness of learning from others, not just reaching, but learning. And how unity in the body of Christ is undermined by similarity. If the oneness is affinity, if the oneness is we're all the same gender, we're all the same ethnicity, we're all the same age, we're all the, that doesn't highlight anything about the unity of Christ. It's when we have all these differences that normally divide people in the world in which we live, and yet there's something deeper. <sighs> so I love this passage up until this point. I'm still working on the last part of the passage because it talks about deep relationships in the family of God. Then it talks about hospitality where you learn to relate to others who aren't similar to you, but yet you show hospitality to them based on the faith that you share. The chapter ends with love your enemies. That's how far he goes with it, that development. How do we love and forgive those who wound us in ministry? How do we not carry the bitterness with us? So what must I learn to develop deeper and broader relationships? 
What can I intentionally do to connect with those I'm yet to get to know? Strangers, pursue the love of strangers. This is a question I often consider. What is my relational range? Is it very narrow, very defined by the patterns of this world, or is it broad? And how am I investing to broaden those relationships? So again, those domains of vitality that we've explored, one is that spiritual, individual, what's going on in me? How am I staying connected? How am I hearing his voice? Another is being part of the body, members of the body, but still able to say, yes, I have to think about myself develop that proper estimation and regulation in how deep and wide our relationship. The flip side of that is when I feel I'm no longer hearing that voice, when I'm either enmeshed and absorbed with people or completely separated from them, or when I don't have a relationship pool that's deep and wide, then I become vulnerable to not experience in that longevity and vitality in ministry. So I'd love to just take a few moments to ask whatever questions you might have based on that. I'll end with this quote and uh, then uh, you're going to handle the mic for us. That'll be great. Um, Mr. Microphone. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, when I started in ministry, I, I spent some time with a guy I consider to be a sage. Steve Babby's his name. And uh, I said, Steve, I'd like to serve one community for a long, long time. What advice would you have for me? And he said two things. So if you forget all the nuances of what I've shared so far, don't forget these two things. He said, one, never stop growing yourself. Because when you stop growing, not only you stop growing, but whatever you lead stops growing. Your family stops growing. Your congregation stops growing. Never stop growing yourself. I thought that's good. It says number two. It said don't do anything stupid. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, a moment of stupidity can undo years of faithfulness. He says, I've seen it time and time again, and maybe we think of moral failure immediately, but he said, it's people getting angry, people making the battle about things that don't matter, people seeking vengeance because of the bitterness. Uh, it's those things that become the fly in the ointment that ruin the perfume. So I leave you with that before questions. Uh, never stop growing. Don't do anything stupid. <laughs> Join me in thanking Pastor Wayne yeah, for this wonderful you. presentation. So we're really informal here. Yep. Just raise your hand, talk into the mic, and if you've got a question or a comment or a challenge. Here's an awkward question for uh, you're resonating with kind of your stupid people uh, sitting around. This is a pretty diverse room in here. Yep. Who's, who's doing that today? And I just think, wow, I would love to be one of those stupid people who would find some safe folks to hang out with. Yeah. Would you guys rec? I don't know if you know people or maybe people in this room. Yeah, I, uh, I love, by the way, the diversity of this group. It's amazing. And uh, I certainly would be blessed to have more sisters in Christ with us. But this is a great uh, uh, diverse group. Barb is with us. There, hey there Barb. are, <laughs> But there are several that were part of that group that are here today, and there are new uh, iterations of that. Uh, Chico, just raise your hand back there. Jonathan and David is one of the th ministries that's been extended in that way. And he, Chico would know others in the room that's, that are connected with that. So, um, But that was a setting in which they were so gracious to this guy. I, I know that at times they thought that's a really stupid question, but this is a safe place and we're so embracing. So thanks for your heart to seek after that. You'll be blessed because of it. Someone else.
Th thank you for all of this. You know, when I uh, pulled into the parking lot, I, there was only about three cars in the back, and I thought, am I the only guy here? Maybe this is just all about me. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and it turns out this was really, truly for me. The mayor of Kentwood, by the way, is uh, working to organize a clergy oh, group. Oh, okay, good. And he invited, uh, I don't know, eight or ten. And so there is interest, and I'm, I'm one, too, that would have uh, interest in fellowship with mm. brothers and sisters. You know, my church, uh, we are slugging it out right now over, um, you know, mor moral issues, homosexual out and so on. And it is just brutal, you know. Uh, people are leaving. Pillar members of the church are leaving. We're incredibly divided. I'm just torn up. Every, to say every day I think about this would be an understatement, but, you know, it's, it's amazing to, you know, uh, and you went through it. You know, should I go, Lord, you know, uh, is there a church for me in, in the Yukon or, you <laughs> know, uh, it, this is just tough. But these are the things that are facing the body today, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I really uh, just appreciate your uh, presentation. And uh, I uh, and thank you for that. I uh, would say that in times like that, this becomes even more critical because Whichever side you take of the issues and whatever those issues are, if you don't maintain this, it does eat your lunch. And um, probably one of the most intense areas of conflict we experienced was related to our multi-ethnic journey. And uh, it was challenging because it tends to go subsurface and people name a lot of issues that aren't the issues because they don't feel they can name the issue that is the issue. And um, boy, during that time, this work in my life was really challenged so that that didn't. Um, and Edmund Edwin Friedman has a phrase. He says, don't be peace mongerers, which is kind of a take on the word warmongers, don't be peacemongers. And, and later on in Romans 12, it says, live at peace with everyone as much as it depends on you. And what a great reminder. So I think in times like this, self-care is not selfish. Make sure you take care of yourself uh, in the midst of the battle. I think that that really beautiful and difficult dichotomy between pleasing and loving and the capacity not to enter into their emotionalism mm -hmm. yet still love yeah yeah that that was worth everything mm -hmm. question pastor Wayne I know we all um, have flesh pattern shadow warrior yeah uh, some I've heard have pride and arrogance uh, not me uh, <laughs> some insecurity can you speak to an understanding as a leader of a flesh pattern that may be there and how you can use it as a gift and not let it become a weakness under duress yeah that's a great uh question uh flesh pattern is one term uh uh a signature sin, a uh, spiritual Achilles heel. Um, and uh, I think part of self-awareness and self-regulation is that. And those who know me know that I've identified mine as insecurity. Um, and so there are all kinds of ugly things that arise out of that, but that is the root. And a lot of my offering plate moments have been different ways God has been trying to dig up that root of insecurity. So in my own life, for whatever it's worth, two things have been helpful to me. One is to never believe I've won that war in that area. Um, Wayne Benson, who was pastor of First Assembly of God for many years, was a mentor in my life. We were both named Wayne, and uh, maybe that's part of the attachment I felt to him. But w back in the day when Jimmy Swaggart and all those folks were blowing up and they were part of that whole movement that was happening, the charismatic movement at that time, 
I never forget his son came to him and said, Dad, would you promise me that you will never? And Wayne said, I can't promise you never. What I can promise you is every day when I get up, I will pray that day that I honor God. And so that's been the kind of Mm -hmm. war, if you will, with insecurity for me. But the other side of that is to live in victory. And and that's the ironic flip side. Um, Not to live your life shaped by that fear or by that weakness. And uh, by God's grace, I still feel insecurity, but rarely does that become the determinative factor in the choices that I make. And that victory is possible in Christ and by his spirit. So, you know, Galatians 5, where it gives you that whole laundry list of potential signature sins, if you need ideas about what they might be, they give, you, they give you a whole menu, and then it goes right into the fruit of the Spirit and the victory and keeping in step with the Spirit. I think it's no mistake that they're together because the reality is we have our Achilles heels. The reality is greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world, isn't it? So that's how I kind of work with it in my life, thanking him for the victory, trying not to develop vulnerability as a result of it. Um, another a question that I've uh, kind of been wrestling through um, probably ever since I started in ministry and, and just work in general um, is priorities, setting appropriate priorities um, and then making sure that they actually fit into a schedule that's reasonable, um, you know, for work and family and stuff like that. And, you know, some of the things that, that I've l- evaluated is like administrative and, and, and prepping, sermon prep and relational and, and – um, Le- you know, kind of like what you said, leadership oriented, which is the investing in yourself type thing, and and just those types of things. Like, how would you and have you um, found that balance and priorities, um, and felt that it fit with some of this? Well, you're the only pastor I've known who's ever struggled with this, so I'll have to make this stuff up. No, 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 not really. Um, two things have really helped me in addition to what I've already talked about with the ability to hear God's voice and what is he asking of me and self-regulation and not pleasing and you know all those kind of things that tend to break down boundaries and all of that Um, so two things one as far as I know I don't remember the source of it I think God just kind of shared it with me and then the other is something I learned from my mentor Uh, I would often talk with our team, and some of the team that I was privileged to serve with are here in the room, uh, about having a focused 50 versus a sloppy 70. And we would work together, hold each other accountable, I think, to say, there will always be more. And so how can I focus in 50 hours, including the weekends, Making room for a Sabbath. I love the book 24-6 that has a healthy perspective on Sabbath. Um, How can I keep working on that 50 and not thinking the answer is going to be another 5, another 10, another 15, another 20? Because that's when the time with family evaporates. That's when all you have left is emotional vapors. Um, So working on that in my own life still today. and it's harder because I r- have a Monday through Friday job, and then I, I'm getting more opportunities on weekends. So I'm, w- I'm wrestling with this right now. When's my Sabbath, and how does that work? The second, and this comes from Dick Wynn, who was the founding pastor of Kentwood Community, and I worked with from the beginning with him, is Mumi's Mutually Understood Ministry Expectations. And whoever supervises you can we reach a mutual understanding of ministry expectations and those conversations even with our board when when it got to be you know these people are feeling like you didn't make the calls that need to be made or not available for the counsel that needs to be given I would be the tendency okay you want me to love God you want me to love my family you want me to be faithful in ministry help me know how to respond to 
I've got these 50 hours. Help me to know how you want me to divide it up. That kind of thing was huge for, uh, because often you need your board or whoever to have that understanding. And if, if it began to be questioned, then I would say to them, okay, I sense that you're feeling like it needs to be changed. So let's talk about it. Um, what do you want me to add? What do you want me to remove? Because we've added. And help me to gain a new understanding. Um, and that was huge, huge, huge. Because expectations are unrelenting and elevating all the time. Media is raising the standard for everything in a pastor's life. So if there's not expectations that are understood, you're, you're vulnerable. So those two things have been of help to me, but I've not experienced it to be something that's done. It's always something I'm working on. So, yeah. Wayne, I don't have a question. I just want to personally thank you for the legacy that you have left within this city and in the hearts of men that you got to know across the racial and denominational barriers that exist in this city. You came into the fellowship that we started for pastors, uh, as you would describe yourself as a uh, possibly a, a, a white guy who didn't know much about uh, uh, black ministers or black people or minorities uh, in general. But after you left the fellowship, before you left, you were a genuine bona fide soul brother. Mm. You were. And uh, we miss you. We deeply miss you because you are, uh, you're, you're an ambassador. I remember when you invited us over to your house and all these black pastors and white pastors sitting around your dinner table, uh, breaking bread together. And, uh, and, and, you know, that picture probably looked like the Last Supper, but uh, <laughs> uh, much more integrated. Um, but it looked like it was a, uh, a snippet from heaven, hmm. because when we get to heaven, brother, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off. Amen. You might be down there at the seminary <laughs> where you're at, but I'm going to tell you something. When we get to heaven, there won't be any breaks or distance between us. Amen. And I just want to thank God for your legacy. Uh, the Jonathan and David Fellowship, uh, actually tomorrow morning at breakfast, we're meeting. It's a, a group of about 40 businessmen and pastors, and we are committed to becoming soul brothers, just like Jonathan and David. And another word for that is accountability partners, but across the racial and denominational barriers. And if you're interested, uh, just go on our website uh, under Chico Daniels Ministries.org, and uh, you can find out more about the Jonathan and David Fellowship. Thank you, brother. Thanks for uh, Thank providing you. that specific information. So Amen. Yeah. Thank you. You know, with that, that that's probably really a that, good way to end. That is a good <laughs> right way. there, everybody.